a prodigious scholar, right? I counted some 70 refereed articles and over 50 books and book chapters, and she's received a new a numeral awards, um, including the Jacob Mincer Award for Lifetime Contributions to the Field of Labor Economics, the German IZA Prize, which is a very uh, prestigious international prize in economics, distinguished fellow in several disciplines, including economics, political science, labor and employment relations, uh, and the Society for Labor e Economists. And she's been president of a number of those associations. Um, and I was reflecting on Fran's life. So I was an undergrad at Cornell in the 1970s. And at the time, I couldn't have imagined that a woman who pursued a, P a BS at the ILR school and a PhD at Harvard would end up achieving the incredible respect and international recognition she has in the field of economics, the most difficult for women to have broken into. More importantly, she's kind and generous. Uh, she uh, came to the ILR school, back to the ILR school in the 90s, and has taught and mentored thousands of students in her classes on the economics of women, men, and work, and based on the textbook that now has eight uh, printings. So Fran, you changed the way that thousands of students think about women, men, and work, not just in this country and beyond. And for that, we thank you deeply and are glad to welcome you as the lecturer today. Um. Rose, thank you so much for that introduction. I think maybe I should just step down <laughs> after that. <laughs> I, 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 I really appreciate it. You did leave out just one thing. Um, I was an undergrad here. You, you, you assumed it. People knew, but I was actually an undergrad at the ILR school. Yep, yes. I thought I made that clear, yeah. but I was going too fast. Yeah, yeah. So, um, let me just begin uh, by by saying how, I'm sorry, I lost my click, oh, here it is, yeah. How, how deeply, deeply honored I, I am to um, be doing this. Um, sorry, it's not, clicker's not working, sorry. I thought I had tried it, but I, I don't think I did. This is, oh, here you go. Well, I, I, I'm not. I don't, I'm not good at this either. <laughs> I'd ask what you did, what you did, but it might take too long. <laughs> okay. Well, I was just so shocked and honored um, to be asked to do this for these two uh, to give a lecture in honor of these two incredible women. And I'm glad, Rose, that I think you did a great job summary, summarizing uh, as best you could their incredible contributions and, and lives. But one thing I'd like to say that's very related to the talk I'm gonna give is what pioneers they were as women. Alice Cook was born 17 years before women got the right to vote. Uh, when women working outside the home was very unusual, she not only pursued a full career and a family, but she um, ended up a professor, a long-term professor at an Ivy League school and has a building named after her. Mm -hmm. She made such a big impact here. I mean, it's just mind blowing. And Lois Gray similarly coming some 20 years later, uh, still so unusual um, what she did. And getting a PhD in economics, I haven't been able to track it back to the 1950s when she did it, but my guess is women might have gotten about 5% of the PhDs in economics then. And I have to tell the economists in the room that her thesis advisor was Gary Becker. And unfortunately, I did not know that till I was researching for this talk, so I never got to talk to Lois about it. They were both all also just incredible, incredible human beings and very uh, engaged in the world. Um, 
and it shows uh, in, in their work. Um, okay, so you've noticed the title of my talk is Gender Inequality in the Labor Market, Continuing Progress, question mark. And unfortunately, the answer to that question is not as happy as I would like it to be. So there really are two aspects to my talk. One is to emphasize there was a half century of progress in increasing women's labor force participation after World War II, a half century of progress. And cumulatively, uh, these labor force participation gains, as I'll be showing you, and improvements in women's education, occupations, and wages have really redefined the role of market work in women's lives. So enormous amount has been achieved. But more recently, um, these gains have stalled or slowed. So in this talk, I'm going to survey both sets of developments and consider the prospects for the future. Um, I have to um, warn you that when economists predict the future, they're not necessarily any better than weathermen. <laughs> they're right some of the time, they're wrong others of the time. Uh, but my belief as I've, as I've surveyed the future and I'll uh, share this with you, is further progress is unlikely without policy intervention, especially in the work family uh, policy area. Uh, in this talk, I draw on my research with many collaborators, um, not all of whom will be mentioned uh, by name as I go along. I have to um, flag my um, favorite collaborator and none of my collaborators find when I say this because it's my husband <laughs> and very frequent collaborator, uh, Larry Kahn. I also want to call out the late Marianne Ferber and Alice Winkler, who are my um, co-authors of the textbook. Again, actually Rose, oh, the ninth edition just came uh -huh. out. So yeah, I'm very, very pleased with that. And working on that has helped to give me kind of an overview that I might not have developed um, sticking um, solely to my individual research projects. So there's substantial progress. It's gone wild. Substantial progress uh, towards uh, gender equality. Uh, I talked about, and I'll go in more detail about rising uh, female labor force participation. I want to say a few words about educational attainment now because I'm actually not going to cover that in detail here uh, due to time. So it's going to be in the background. But the gains in education are um, uh, really amazing. Um, men used to be better educated than women more likely to be college graduates than women. Women caught up to men in college graduation in 1980, which was an achievement in and of itself, but uh, they didn't stop there. They actually surpassed men. So now um, women are more likely to get college degrees than men are. The majority of college educated uh, workers and in, uh, individuals in the labor force is actually female. And uh, colleges on average have 58% uh, of degrees awarded to women. So it's, uh, and not just in the United States, there have been gains actually internationally in this respect. Uh, but I'm gonna focus on participation, declining gender differences in occupations. And that is since 1970. So let me step back. When I first started studying the gender gap, one big insight I got actually from sociology was uh, one of the most striking differences between men and women in the labor market. And to this day, it is still true to some extent is um, that men and women tend to work in different occupations. And the term that has been given to this is occupational segregation. So I'm gonna show you a little bit about these occupational disparities that do still exist, but have narrowed noticeably since 1970. And then there's the famous uh, gender pay gap, which has been narrowing since 1980. Progress in occupations and pay have, has actually slowed, however, and I'll be uh, explaining that. So these incremental and 
mutually reinforcing gains have not just reduced gender inequality, but fundamentally changed gender roles. And uh, Claudia Golden, a well-known economist, also a Cornell graduate, um, called this a quiet revolution. And Ralph Smith, another economist, called this a subtle revolution. And they were right, except as probably neither of them would deny, it's an unfinished revolution. There still are substantial uh, gender differences. And currently, again, uh, we seem to have stalled or slowed markedly. So let's start with labor force participation. Um, this chart shows labor force participation rates since 1947. Uh, we have on the vertical axis, the participation rate and on the horizontal axis of the year. And you see that uh, long-term increase for women until about the mid 1990s when it plateaus. And actually um, there is a little decrease subsequently. I would say that is not necessarily long-term that is uh, related to uh, the great recession and the COVID recession. And if you compare to men, men have the opposite uh, trend, decreasing participation and actually show a very similar dips for the Great Recession and uh, COVID. So uh, labor force uh, participation appears to have plateaued, but look at what has been gained. In 1947, there was uh, over a 50 percentage point gap in labor force participation between men and women. Uh, uh, only about a third of women worked outside the home. Now it's 57% compared to 68% uh, of men and the gap is uh, much smaller. These 2022 numbers might look a little low to you. Um, one reason they're low is this chart is for everybody 16 years of age and over. And so if we look at this, and we will be doing the so-called prime working years, I say so-called because uh, I've aged out of them, <laughs> but um, uh, it's uh, 25 to 54, and they're considered prime working years because most people, apologies to the PhD students in the room, most people are done with their education by then. <laughs> and um, uh, they have not yet hit the retirement years. So uh, what I want to emphasize is that this has not just been an increase in participation rates, but also a change in the pattern of women's labor force participation over the life cycle as successive groups of women enter the labor force. And this is basically rising labor force attachment. And this is the key and what's crucial to women's advancement in the labor force. And so if we start with 1940, and in this graph, we have um, participation rates on the vertical axis and age on the horizontal axis. In 1940, these age participation patterns show us that the peak working age was 20 to 24. And after that, participation rates of women tended to decrease. Why did they decrease? because very few women worked um, after marrying and still fewer after having children. So uh, family and work were uh, not generally combined. The next, 60, the next 20 years to 1960 uh, brought one major development and that was a second hump here. And uh, notice no change in the prime childbearing years at that time, 25 to 34, but we had an additional group of uh, women come into the labor force when uh, their children grew older of school age and may have even left the household. So that was the next development. 1980 brought, brought another development. And here we see participation rates increased in virtually all age groups. But the very crucial thing was even in these uh, younger, um, younger groups here, 25 to 34, and uh, throughout the potential childbearing years. 
Now, there were a number of reasons uh, uh, in a descriptive sense for this increase, uh, falling birth rates, um, increased divorce rates. Uh, but the thing that I think is most central is there was a big increase in labor force participation rates of moms with preschool children, including married mothers. So this was a big shift in uh, the labor force participation over the life cycle. 2000 brought still more women in across the board. And by the way, by the time we get to 1980 and 2000, the the female participation over the life cycle is starting to look more like the male rate. But then this is the halting. 2019 is lying on top of 2000 because we have not seen further increases till then. And we are left with a gap or a difference still between male participation rates and female participation rates, uh, despite substantial progress. Um, okay, so um, what accounts for these changes? Just very briefly, rising labor market opportunities. Um, interestingly, fundamental changes in the economy benefited women because women happen to be located, as we'll see, in um, clerical jobs and white collar jobs and in education and health, all areas that were growing. So that raised the demand for women and helped to um, draw them into the labor force. Anti-discrimination laws and other social changes raised the demand for women in traditionally male occupations. So that drew women in. Uh, they also was the case that the value, the subjective value people put on home time uh, decreased over time. We had, as I mentioned, four smaller families, increasing divorce. I haven't mentioned yet single motherhood. Uh, technological changes that made it easier to do housework and a wide array of market substitutes ranging from uh, frozen food to fast food. Uh, changing norms were probably important. And given current circumstances, let me say that evidence suggests availability of contraception was very important to this. So this is a puzzle. Uh, the trends were determined by fundamental factors that were widespread across many countries. It's puzzling that progress has halted in the US. And we don't know for sure what's caused the stalling uh, but you could argue that over 20 years of stability uh, means that future increases in labor force participation um, are unlikely. And I would say, no, they could occur because international comparisons strongly suggest that further gains are possible. You compare the US experience to um, other countries, but you need appropriate work family policies. So um, back in 2013, uh, Larry Kahn and I wrote a paper where we emphasized that the US experience contrasts sharply with the experience in other countries. So in 1990, the US was a leader in female labor force participation we ranked six out of 22 uh, advanced in uh, economically advanced countries. By 2010, so we were at almost at the top of close to the top, by 2010, we were at close to the bottom. We had one of the lower participation rates. And you know, I'm kind of working on this stuff all the time. I'm updating my textbook. There's certain countries I took for granted, way behind the US, way behind, wait a minute, they've caught up, wait a minute, they've exceeded us. Many countries that I had regarded as more traditional. But what those other countries did is they expanded family friendly, friendly policies, like parental leave, rights to part-time employment, right to request part-time employment, and uh, expenditures on childcare. And they did this relative to the US and Larry and I showed particularly the uh, parental leave and part-time employment rights portion in our work, but childcare and some other works by some other people 
explained a substantial portion of why the U.S. was um, lagging behind. And I'm going to say more about the specifics of the policies towards the end. Um, but let me look at occupational attainment. And uh, there's a lot of lines on this graph, but basically what I have here is um, uh, the proportion of men and the proportion of women in each of these, uh, in the labor force, in each of these occupational categories. And they're broad occupational categories because it makes it easier to, to um, see. Um, we're familiar with a lot of them, professional, managerial, service, sales, clerical, production. Other manual, I have collapsed um, a number of categories there for the interest of space, but this includes um, skilled and craft uh, blue collar positions as well as uh, labor positions. So um, let me help you along by uh, calling a few things to your attention. So um, there's a few areas where women were in 1970, I should have said this was for 1970, overrepresented. So women, nearly a third of all women in the labor force in 1970 were in clerical jobs compared to 8% of men. 20% of women were in service jobs compared to 10% of men. Service jobs are quite varied, but they tend on average to be low paying. Uh, clerical jobs are good mid-level jobs from, if I say a female perspective, but they tend to pay less, less than many uh, male occupations. Uh, half the female labor force was, was in these two areas and some, somebody even dubbed that the pink collar ghetto, service and clerical jobs. Uh, women were well represented in professional jobs, slightly more represented in professional jobs than men were, but they were in very different professional jobs. They were overwhelmingly in uh, predominantly female professions like education, uh, uh, K through 12 and preschool uh, education, childcare, um, and uh, nursing. So what were men doing? Well, men were overrepresented in management compared to women. 14% of men were managers compared to just 5% of women. Only one out of um, five managers was female in 1970. And there were articles written, could women enter management? Would people listen to a woman in a managerial job? You laugh now. <laughs> but they were serious questioning. Uh, men were also over a huge disparity in these other, what I've called other manual occupations, 27% of men and just 3% um, of women. So even at this level of these broad occupational categories, we saw very large gender differences. So we'll fast forward to 2019, what's happening there, I think, one of the biggest and most important changes for women were that they made enormous gains in management and now only lagging a bit behind men. Um, the other really important thing was they very much increased um, the proportion of them in managerial jobs. That's good, but even better is they began to break into, to enter these traditionally male professions like particularly law and medicine. And their share in clerical jobs dropped. So you could say, or their concentration, not share, their concentration in clerical jobs dropped. So you could say that women essentially upgraded their occupational distribution in the sense of, um, earnings because they moved out of lower paying jobs into higher paying jobs. So what happened to men? Oh, excuse me, before I go on, important caveat and is that this doesn't show glass ceilings, how high up people go, and it doesn't show segregation within categories, uh, like say within the professional category. Okay, so what were men doing? Uh, Men did actually, if we had 
all these numbers, on, all these lines on the same chart, which I wouldn't try to do. Uh, they did increase their proportion a bit in, manage, in managerial, the portion of them in management, and they increased a bit their proportion in professional jobs, so not the huge increases that uh, women got, and most importantly, the disparities, um, gender disparities in management uh, decreased, but uh, men also had some unhappy uh, changes. Um, they lost a lot of production jobs. I think this number was 17% in 1970. So those are relatively high paying production jobs and they increased their representation in service, which uh, as I mentioned is relatively low paying. So it's not entirely good news for men as it is for women. And then before, uh, Leaving detail, uh, the, the uh, overall occupational description um, completely, I did want to put this up, especially for the younger people who did not live this, through this personally. But you may not really even be able to imagine how underrepresented women were in these occupations in 1970. This is the percent female in, in, in jobs selected to be professional jobs where women have made a lot of progress. 11% of doctors were women. Now it's 41% and it's headed towards 50%. Uh, the uh, medical program is uh, headed towards 50% there, but we have still the people who were trained during a time when women were a minority. As those people retire, it'll go towards 50%. And that's similar with law. Women were 7% uh, of lawyers, and now um, they are headed again towards 50%, um, though it'll take a while to get there. Uh, even clergy, women have increased their representation in clergy. Nobody in 1970 would have imagined that. Um, pharmacists has actually flipped. I'm not completely happy about that because I'd like to see occupational integration, not movement of a job from predominantly male to predominantly female, but now women were minority pharmacists and now they're 60%. So I wanted to give you a flavor for some of the gains, but in full disclosure, and it is important, I have to say much less progress in STEM fields. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. Women actually have increased in some sciences like biology, but uh, in fields like physics, in engineering fields, in the whole uh, tech sector, um, there hasn't been as much uh, progress. So before leaving completely this topic, um, uh, I'd like to mention some research that I did with um, Peter Brummond and Albert Liu. And um, this is looking at trends in occupational segregation. So just let me back up a little bit. Um, there are hundreds of detailed occupations I could look at, and I could have the chart like I just had a minute ago, and I go on and on and on. The uh, index of segregation is uh, sometimes called an index of dissimilarity. It summarizes all that information and gives us the proportion of women or men who would have to change jobs for the occupational distribution of the two groups to be the same. And uh, as you see, if we start in 1970, this number was very high. Nearly two thirds of women or men would have to change jobs for the two, uh, two genders to have the same occupational distribution. And we saw considerable progress of declining segregation over the 80s, declining further declines in the 90s, and then notice how this is slowing. Um, so, and it's slowing where it stopped is at around 50%. So it's still the case that about 50% of women would have to change jobs to equalize occupation. So we, we aren't there yet and we're not getting there uh, very quickly anymore. And uh, in, in evaluating the prospects for change, I just want you to think about where the least progress has been made and whether you think the prospects there are very good. Uh, bringing more women into STEM, we've been talking about this for a long time, 
progress has not been very quick there. Uh, moving women up the hierarchy to CEO positions. Some of this is not reflected in the occupational structure, but there are uh, major disparities there. And some of that shows up, by the way, in management, not just in the level of management, but also the tendency of women to be in staff positions that don't lead to the top and men to be in line positions. We would have to, to further reduce segregation, we'd have to bring more women into um, traditionally male blue collar jobs been almost no change in that. And we would have to induce more men to enter predominantly female jobs. I, jobs. I didn't mention this, but actually the entire, virtually the entire gains we've seen have been through women moving into male occupations and not the opposite. As an economist, I don't have too much trouble explaining that because considerable research has shown that all else equal, controlling for qualifications, women's jobs tend to be less, to pay less than men's jobs. If women's jobs pay less than men's jobs, we're not going to be able to uh, bring that many men in. Uh, contributing factors where policy could matter, uh, work family issues again, um, and working conditions uh, is, is another factor that's important. Um, Women may avoid jobs where long hours are de facto required or heavily incentivized. And our, our own um, Kim Whedon of Cornell has done research on the tendency of many occupations to um, increase hours over the past um, few decades. And um, this is sort of interesting from a skill dimension because it's actually the case that high skilled workers are under more and more pressure to work longer hours, whereas um, low skilled workers, um, their hours have gone, uh, have actually on average declined and they may not be getting all the hours that, that they would like to. Um, obviously, um, this kind of working condition is hard for women with, who are juggling family responsibilities to, by the way, I, I checked this out with a lawyer, but it's really true. Part-time work in um, high-end law firms um, is 40 hours a week. <laughs> That's part-time. <laughs> they said, this woman is working part-time. She's working 40 hours. Everyone else is supposed to work 50 or 60. Okay. And of course, our old friend discrimination uh, is still uh, likely a factor. So what about the gender pay gap? Uh, this is actually something that's in, interested me um, for a long time. I wrote my uh, doctoral dissertation on an aspect of this. Um, and what you see, this is based on government data. I have 1955 to uh, 2021. And what you see is that for a long time, we had um, women earning about 60% of what men earn. These are two different uh, government series. One is based on annual uh, earnings, the other on weekly earnings for full-time workers. And uh, no change until about 1980 when there was a sharp increase through about 1990. And then it started to taper off. Uh, it looks better than the occupational picture. More seems to be going on. Uh, I did notice the last few years I entered to get this chart ready. It seems to be showing something, but it's a very weird time over COVID, et cetera. So I wouldn't, you know, there are other times when things seem to be jumping up only to level out and plateau. Now, um, this is something that uh, Larry and I recently worked on uh, explaining and accounting for um, changes over time in the gender pay gap. And um, what this chart shows is, um, the wage ratio of women relative to men. And the blue bars show uh, just unadjusted. If you um, just uh, took the dollar figures uh, for each and you uh, divided through, it's done in logs, but I won't get involved with that right now. So the first interesting or further interesting point is this red bar, 
which says, what would happen if uh, men and women had the same human capital? And human capital, I'm emphasizing here, are levels in, of education and share of advanced degrees and actual labor market experience, because traditionally men and women have, uh, excuse me, traditionally women have moved in and out of the labor force, sometimes in response to um, uh, family needs. And so it's very important, especially historically, to control for the actual labor market experience that they have. And let's look a little harder at 1980. 1980 tells a very interesting and clear story. Women earning around a little over 60% of what men earn. If we equalize their education experience, um, they um, would earn considerably more, although of course less than 100%. Um, and then if we further in the green bars, adjusted not just for human capital, but also for occupation industry and whether or not workers are unionized, we would get still more of the gap accounted for and we would get up to about 80%. So we understand what's going on in 1980. If we fast forward to 2010, a really surprising development occurs. And that is uh, on the good side, let me mention that the relative earnings of uh, wages of women go up as we're expecting, they're now about 80%. But when we equalize education experience, we don't change uh, the figure very much. Why is that? Well, again, today, women are actually better educated than men. So education doesn't help explain the gender pay gap. And due to these trends in labor force attachment, women have really narrowed the experience gap with men. So experience doesn't explain as much as it used to. So what is still important is occupation and, and industrial differences between men and women. They do account for a lot, even though we do have the enormous uh, occupational gains that women have made. Um, I mentioned before that um, women still earn less than men, even when you control for the characteristics that we're able to control for. We call that the unexplained gap. And the unexplained gap is potentially related to discrimination, although it's not a perfect measure. It's, it's pay differences that are unaccounted for by measured characteristics, but I as a researcher don't necessarily know all the factors that are important or have data on all the factors that are important to an employer. So some of it could be due to um, unobserved in my data differences between men and women. But let's take um, the idea, and we, there is some evidence for this, that it's at least um, correlated with discrimination. What you see is between 1980 and 1989, the unexplained gap, the difference between 100% and the green and red lines, it decreased quite a bit. So the unexplained gap, potentially discrimination fell quite a bit in the 80s, but it hasn't changed in the, um, do my math, in the 20 years since about 1990 has not changed. So um, that is a concerning thing um, about future progress. We see women working their way up by improving their occupations, um, by improving their human capital, um, narrowing the unexplained gap, but now that process does not seem to be going on so much anymore. And the gender wage gap is slowing, Larry and I found, more slowly at the top, at the 90th percentile, both uh, unadjusted and adjusted for measured uh, characteristics. So this calls to mind a possibility, at least, of a glass ceiling. So what are my takeaways on the gender pay gap? Uh, again, women narrowed the pay gap with men by increasing their education and experience, moving into higher paying occupations. I haven't mentioned it so much 
uh, I haven't mentioned yet, but union differences we found narrowed between men and women. That's not an entirely happy story because they narrowed primarily because men lost unionized jobs and uh, got more similar to women in that respect in their degree of unionization. Um, over the 1980s, the unexplained gap narrowed, possibly reflecting decreases in discrimination, but no further narrowing has occurred. And the pay gap has closed more slowly at the top, possibly reflecting uh, glass ceiling issues. What are the prospects for further reduction in the gender pay gap? I think human capital is not a very likely source of further changes. What more can women do in a sense? I mean, they've got more education than men now and they're really reduced the experience gap. So I don't think that can uh, produce further future gains. There's more scope for occupation to equalize between men and women because there's a lot of disparities there, but we've already shown that they're located in very stubborn areas. But again, I feel policy could matter. A, in other analyses uh, uh, by other scholars of the gender pay gap, people have pointed to the child penalty as being the crucial point at which men's and women's wa uh, wages and earnings start to diverge. Uh, that is when the first child is born. And so that child penalty could potentially be possibly positively impacted by work family policies, uh, especially childcare. Um, changing employer policies to reduce uh, de facto long hours requirements could be helpful to women, but I don't know how you do that. I mean, maybe we can talk about it and think about it, but that's, uh, I don't think you can legislate that. So it, it really would be a job of uh, convincing employers that they don't need these long hours. And if we have a chance, we can circle back to it. But work that Claudia Golden has done is pointed out that these kind of long hour uh, requirements come in settings where employers don't see workers as very close substitutes for each other. If workers have individual information that is uh, unique to them and their coworkers don't have, you want them to be there when they're when a client calls, um, et cetera. So more teamwork could is something that could possibly influence this. And of course, anti-discrimination policies. So I've talked a lot about policy. Let me say a little bit more about it. What, do, what about work family policy? Let me fill in a little bit more here uh, because uh, to give you a better picture. Uh, the US does much less of this than other countries. Uh, in terms of parental leave in the United States, based on the uh, Family and Medical Leave Act, employers since 1993 are required to provide 12 weeks of unpaid leave. This compares to an average over a set of uh, other uh, economically advanced countries of 52 weeks, all paid to some extent. I think the US is one of the only countries in the world that has unpaid leave. Now, when I say paid, people aren't necessarily paid at the same rate as they would um, make uh, if they were working. There's something called a replacement ratio, but still uh, paid leave. And as I uh, went through kind of quickly before, in some countries, you have the right to request part-time work if your uh, family situation changes. Um, in some countries, uh, employers are, uh, required to honor that request in a small number of countries in a wider number of countries, they are required not to penalize people for asking. And the US government spends far uh, less on childcare than many other countries. Um, so formulating an optimal policy though is complicated and there may be important trade-offs. Um, one thing Larry and I noted in our research is that the US does worse uh, in female labor force participation, but we do better in terms of the female share of managerial workers and those in traditionally male professions. So putting it a little differently, we have uh, fewer women who are able to make it work in the labor market, 
But the women who are in the labor market seem to actually be doing better than in some um, other countries. So what I think this brings home is uh, the need to avoid mommy tracking. And mommy tracking is a term that refers to shunting women who have um, family responsibilities to the side. And some types of particularly parental leave could potentially do that. So if parental leave is very extended, like an average of 52 weeks, look at it from the perspective of the woman. She's receiving some kind of replacement ratio for this. Um, and so it might induce her to stay out longer than she otherwise would. And in doing that, she may fall behind or in anticipating doing that, she may not enter some fields. Or from the employer's perspective, um, are you going to fast track an employee who you think might leave for a year? Um, of course, you shouldn't discriminate against women for taking um, a, a, an entitlement like parental leave, but we all know that discrimination can occur. Um, and that's for um, one child, potentially 52 weeks, that she might have another child. So um, I fear that um, it, there is, um, there's a tendency to think more is always better and less is worse. But I think that we have to start thinking very uh, clearly in this area that there may be an optimal level of parental leave. Oh, by the way, I'd like to say the same for a requesting part-time because part-time work because in most virtually all countries, part-time work is not equivalent and doesn't have the same advancement opportunities as full-time work. We wanna encourage women uh, to work part-time. Um, I want to hasten to add that with the extremely low levels of uh, mandated parental leave in the United States, and the lack of pay, I am not worried in the United States about expanding parental leave a bit and uh, certainly not uh, paying for it. I would not anticipate negative effects for that. I, I have an anecdote. Actually, I was once um, very honored, uh, asked to give a briefing with a group of economists to um, then President Obama. It was just a... Um, really exciting. And I was talking about some of these issues and I did say that very extended leaves could have <laughs> negative effects. He said, not a problem in the US. <laughs> and he was right, <laughs> as he goes about many things. Um, I wanna point out if we want to do something about work family policy, spending on childcare and early education is not um, subject to these possible trade-offs. It's kind of, win-win from the perspective of um, the woman making it easier to combine work and family, but also um, to um, not take, you know, long, long-term time out, unless she wants to. You know, none of this is to say that uh, I'm going to mandate uh, market work for everybody. And I do want to make the point that work-family policies of both types potentially benefit children and families as well as women. I mean, this is a incredible area of enormous, uh, what economists called externalities. And we terribly under, under invest in children in the United States compared to other countries. This is an opportunity to invest more. If I was uh, in charge, one of the first things I would do is uh, have universal preschool. Totally win-win. Uh, what about discrimination? This, the picture is a little different there. The US actually has a long commitment to anti-discrimination policy dating to the mid 1960s. We were actually a leader in this area. And Title VII of the Civil Rights Act and the uh, executive order under which uh, we have um, our non-discrimination and affirmative action requirements for federal contractors they're very strong uh, and impressive pieces of legislation to me. Uh, there are some issues with enforcement that we could look at. Uh, one is enforcement 
clearly its documentable tends to fluctuate with changing administrations. And the change is Republican to Democratic and vice versa. Democrats are much more serious about enforcing these laws than the Republicans historically. Another issue is the legal process can be very drawn out, very drawn out. I mean, you could be at retirement age by the time your case is adjudicated and that's um, important, something we have to think about. There are some interesting new anti-discrimination issues, uh, initiatives that I'd like to flag here that are worth thinking about. Salary history bans, uh, where uh, employers are not allowed to ask people's salary history when they're thinking of hiring them uh, with the idea, um, and Larry reminded me in a, in a related case, a judge cited our work pointing out that if there's discrimination in the labor market as a whole, if you look at salary history to determine how much to pay, you could be importing the market-wide uh, discrimination. Pay transparency is also interesting uh, as an idea in many firms. It's really impossible for uh, individuals to know they're discriminated against to find out what their um, coworkers are, are making. So uh, in conclusion, um, I think we're at something of a crossroads. Um, after decades of progress across multiple and mutually reinforcing areas, change has slowed or stalled. The second bullet point is something that I've thought a lot about and I don't have a firm answer for. It's possible the status quo could persist. The status quo has persisted in a good way. I mean, in the sense that we can keep the gains that we have, that we've been doing pretty well. Um, um, for the past 20 years or so in maintaining um, our gains, if not enhancing them as much as we'd like. But it is also possible we could move or lose ground. And if you don't move forward, sometimes um, you might move back. And in that regard, the recent uh, Supreme Court decision that uh, took away the right to abortion, uh, resulting in multiple states in the United States where women do not have a, a, a right to abortion, with hints that that could be expanded to some other methods of contraception. Um, I worry, I worry about that. But on the positive side, further change um, could occur if we have the uh, appropriate policies. And I think it's up to all of us to, uh, who would like to, to advocate for those policies and vote for uh, uh, our representatives who are likely to implement them. Thank you. Moderate, sure. Okay. Hi, uh, I am Pam Tolbert, and I'm uh, the Lois Gray professor, so one of the three groups here. Um, do, and do we introduce Rose as the Alice Cook professor? Alice Cook, yes. <laughs> and I'm the Francis Perkins professor. So <laughs> we're, re we're representing the history of the school. And three great women here. <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to serve as the moderator. Uh, and in, let me open it up at this point to questions. Yeah. We, we have a few questions online. Um, one is zero sum game issue. If, if we created numbers of women in certain fields, how would that affect opportunities for men? Can you repeat the question also in the mic so we have it? Okay, I will try and repeat the question. Uh, so it's a, is it a zero sum game, basically? I mean, you saw the graphs with men's labor force participation going down while women's go up. I, I think, is that basically the well, issue? I, well, in the, in the occupations. So more women entering this desirable occupation, A, does that create less opportunities for men uh, in that occupation? And um, it's, 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 it's interesting. Um, I don't think there is um, a lot of evidence. I'm more familiar with it at the, um, the pay uh, area of, of, of um, 
women's advancements pulling men down. Uh, I, I really haven't seen any um, convincing evidence of that, but I have to say, frankly, um, men could and maybe are facing more competition. Uh, if you can rule out a whole class of people from uh, being lawyers and doctors um, and architects, et cetera, you know, then there's probably more competition as um, they seek to enter. Was there another? There, there are a few. Um, I'll just ask one more. Um, uh, how do these findings vary for women of color? And I think you touched on discrimination. So the question was, how, do, how does race intersect with gender in terms of discrimination? I mean, this is obviously an excellent question. And I want to apologize for not covering um, more of, or any of this in the talk, trying to east side. I used my time very, uh, you know, uh, almost overused it. So a very good question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, it's... Uh, some of the trends are quite similar. Um, uh, Black women's labor force participation rates have increased. Um, interestingly, um, Black women have a longer and stronger commitment in the United States to the labor force than white women do. Traditionally, their participation rates were higher than those of uh, white women, both um, continuing the tradition of uh, work in outside uh, or hard work that was developed during slavery and also due to the low uh, incomes of their husbands. Again, they're often um, working outside the home throughout our history and um, their participation rates have increased as well, but white women have essentially caught up to them in participation and there are not uh, strong race differences uh, in that regard. In terms of occupations, it's very clear their occupational uh, distribution is even less favorable, and in particular, less uh, representation in managerial and professional jobs. Uh, and their uh, wages are lower still than those of white women. And, and discrimination, I believe, does play an important role in many of these uh, differences as well as uh, educational differences um, between black and white individuals that date um, to slavery and um, uh, the um, uh, absence of education given to them, prohi prohibition against education given to them at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Alex. I'm interested in the, um, uh, the issue of the hours of work and how that ties to gender outcomes. We know there's this variation across countries in average annual hours of work, uh, in part because of different regulations in terms of leave entitlements, like summer vacation entitlements, holiday days, and hours of work regulation. Is, is there any evidence of whether those variations in policies and hours of work um, do have any effect on uh, gender equality outcomes? Um, I think that's a great question. I think from a theoretical perspective, um, uh, you're right on target. I can't off the top of my head think of research that's looked at that, but it could well pay, play a role. There's a whole other um, aspect of this I, I wasn't able to um, get into, and that's some work that um, uh, Larry and I have done on international differences in the gender pay gap. And actually, the U.S. does not stack, stack up there uh, very well at all. We are one of the countries with the larger uh, gender pay gaps. But what Larry and I found was a lot of this was uh, related to wage setting institutions. Uh, we didn't look at ours, but we did look at unionization. And what unions tend to do is bring up the bottom and middle of the wage distribution and women are disproportionately located there. So women disproportionately benefit. And it is quite possible that ours is playing uh, a role as well. Yeah, yeah, I can hear it. Michelle, yeah. Uh, yes, well, thank you for so a really, really nice lecture, nice overview of, uh, of uh, all you know. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to ask uh, you a question about um, uh, the future and the prediction of the future. 
So one thing that I came to realize is that many of the jobs that are, say, threatened by automation seem to be actually disproportionately held by women right now. Mm. And so um, uh, all these clerical admin jobs uh, seem to be uh, yeah, mostly uh, female. Um, and so it seems to be maybe we have another wave to, uh, you know, another reason to worry about the future. But on the other hand, technological change could actually perhaps offer a solution to this issue of long hours and substitutability between, between workers. So it might be actually easier to actually, uh, I don't know, work in teams and so on. And, and I just was wondering what your view is on, on this. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so the, the point about clerical work is just um, fascinating. It may change. But I think it's been going on for quite a while. Technology has um, reduced the demand for clerical work. But what happened is that women upgraded or the women who might have otherwise gone into clerical work went into professions and went into management. In fact, some people used to think snidely that a number of the women clerical workers were already in management, but they weren't uh, given the title. Um, so I'm less worried about that, though we could be reaching sort of a saturation in terms of other jobs people can move into, and it might uh, start to, sh to, to show. Um, the question about technology, I think, is uh, <clears throat> really an excellent one. And uh, there was a whole other lecture I might have or could have given on COVID and the impact of COVID on gender. Uh, issues and a lot of it is has been very difficult for women and and uh, has had uh, negative effects. But one possible uh, silver lining that people have pointed to is and 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 we may be forgetting, by the way, uh, you know, over the course of three or four years, who heard of Zoom before COVID? I mean, not me. You know, that's a an enormous technological advance. And some of that will stick. Uh, the possibility of remote work and especially partial uh, remote work could, could really be a boon for women in terms of interjecting uh, flexibility. Um, back uh, before all this, people, I, I would run into people sometimes who'd say wistfully, gee, if only workers could work entirely from home, then women could take care of children and work full time at the same. And I was like saying, have you ever taken care of a three-year-old? You know I mean? So I think the partial aspect is intriguing. So technology, I agree with you, that might, that might be helpful. On the other hand, some of us have benefited a lot from technology and what we've found is that you can work around the clock. <laughs> Yes, Kelly. Well, thanks so much. I've learned so much from your work. Um, so I was just thinking about that final slide, I guess up here, you know, thinking about the future and also thinking about where change has come from. And as you say, it's really from changes in women's behavior, women moving into other occupations, women having fewer kids, having them later. Um, so women primarily adjusting to uh, try to attain that status with men. I mean, one other possibility here is that men change. Um, and I wonder, you know, just in the spirit of uh, pontificating on the future, you know, what do you think of the prospects for that? Some men can move into their occupations, you mentioned that, but they can also take parental leave and enter into more active childcare roles. Um, so. Yes, I'm really glad you brought that up, Kelly. And, um, can you repeat the question? Oh, sure, sure. So um, what has happened so far, I think Kelly's right, is for the most part, except for literally anti-discrimination uh, policies, is that women have changed to accommodate existing institutions. What are the prospects for men changing? And is that another additional path towards um, gender equality? And I think, um, uh, certainly on paper it is. So um, I, I, I was talking before about when women take very extended parental leave or long parental leave that could work against women as a group. But if men and women shared the parental leave, then um, 
neither sex group would necessarily suffer. That's one example. By the way, I was going, I was um, uh, organizing the labor workshop for next semester, and I was um, looking at names of people who had been um, uh, uh, recommended for talks, and there was uh, an economist who was a professor in Scandinavian country, and I went to his website, and it was a big thing on parental leave. <laughs> so they have done more than we have. Um, for the most part though, even in those cases, men are taking a relatively short part of the leave and women are taking a uh, much longer leave. Or we have this incredibly uh, sobering finding in the economics profession where some uh, schools have mandated uh, parental leave for both uh, men and women. And the reason for uh, professors, let's say, male and female professors, the reason for doing this is because women may not ask for or take the full amount of leave they're entitled to because they don't want to stand out as someone who's not doing their part. So if you mandate, if, some, if uh, someone has a child, they have to take leave. They found it had a negative effect on women's promotion because women were spending their leaves taking care of children. <laughs> but men were just spending their leaves doing research <laughs> and advancing, you know? So it's tricky. It's tricky. But <laughs> I think you're right. That is definitely a margin that should be mentioned, and we should continue to push on that as best we could. Another small silver lining of COVID is many men had a lot more experience with household uh, chores and activities during COVID and some of that may stick. Question at the back. Uh, think specifically around the policy opportunities with Can you patrons. stand up and oh, think, sorry. <laughs> Um, thinking specifically around the policy room around pay transparency of the lever, do you have a sense of progress made on starting salary versus salary progression and how those are contributing to the gap differentially? Um, so you're asking about starting salaries separately and, you know, whether um, that's when inequality is kind of starting or... Um, did you ask whether they were pretty more equal? Have they been changing differentially, knowing that the pay gap happens kind of both statically when women enter and as well as over time, over their career trajectories relative to men? So um, I haven't like gone into a firm personally, I mean, you know, used uh, firm data, establishment data and documented at something called uh, starting salaries, but, what we have noticed in the data very clearly is that the, the gender gap tends to be smaller at younger ages, and then it broadens and fans out with age. And there's a number of possible reasons for this. I mean, one reason is the advent of child, children and family responsibilities may lead women to um, cut back in various ways, maybe not leave the labor force entirely, but um, shift over to lower paying jobs that are more compatible with their families, turn down promotions, et cetera. But it's also possibly part and due in part to discrimination because what's happening over time is some people are getting promoted and moving up and other people aren't, and they may be disproportionately male. In terms of the gap itself, it's a, a fascinating way to look at it. And it is true that over time, new cohorts are coming and doing better than previous cohorts at similar ages. So the young women today are earning more relative to their male counterparts than young women uh, did a number of years ago. Yes. Uh, thank you. For, for all of this. Um, I was gonna ask, we have a lot of people from different disciplines in this room. Um, what are our marching orders for, for continuing progress going forward? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. It's not, not, I don't think what you're necessarily asking, although you might. Um, I was once at a, um, I may, a session at a conference and somebody asked within economics, um, do you think women should work on uh, gender issues. 
and uh, in their research. And uh, before I had a chance to answer, one person said immediately, absolutely, every woman should be working on gender issues. They're important <laughs> and every woman should be working on them. And another woman said, no woman should work on this. <laughs> There's discrimination against people who work on gender issues. And um, anyway, obviously I don't, I don't hold with either of those. Uh, I think people should work on what interests them, but I think it would be fascinating and helpful going forward from an interdisciplinary uh, perspective to continue studying these policy issues. I think these policy issues are you know, uh, very central here. Yes. Hey, I'm, I'm Anton. I'm in Brooks Public Policy. I was just, um, I'll stand up. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, I was just wondering, you, you talked about uh, how anti discrimination enforcement kind of fluctuates with different administrations. Is that observed at a national level? Is it, uh, but is it also state level or local level? And just more about that. Yeah, so um, I said that it tends to fluctuate, enforcement tends to fluctuate. Um, is, and, and the question was, is that observed at the national level, at a state and local level? Um, I haven't looked at the state and local level. That would just be fascinating. If, if I don't know if anyone has, so that'd be interesting. What I, at the national level, what makes it clear is a number of cases filed by the EEOC. There's data on that, and that uh, clearly fluctuates. It's interesting going all the way back to um, President Reagan. One of the things he wanted to do was to get rid of the affirmative action requirement under the executive order. He actually put out or was thinking of putting out regulations to do that. He was anti-affirmative action. And what I heard at the time was that uh, firms objected. His firm said, we have benefited from the, these policies. These policies give us cover vis-a-vis -vis our employee, our other employees to help uh, advance groups. And um, so that was an interesting, but, but, the, but in light of your question, I'd like to say he's Republican and he wanted to get rid of it, you know? Um, so there, and I don't even want to go to the last um, occupant of, the one of our, you know, uh, under the President Trump. I, I, I haven't got data on them yet, but I, I would imagine if there was any way to cut back, he, they would have. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Helen. Um, you mentioned sort of some laws um, like protect the right to request part-time work. Um, could you speak more about that and how um, mothers returning to the labor force might benefit? Uh, yeah, so I mean, um, so um, what exists in other kind? Well, all right. So we know when mothers return to the labor force, it may be difficult to uh, to to juggle, and part time work may be appealing. And so one issue arises whether you can convert the former position to a, a part time position. And as I said in the talk, in some countries, employers are required to do so if asked. That's a relatively small number of countries. And other countries, the, the worker just has the right to ask and they can't like hold it against uh, the worker. Um, I think that people should have a, um, a variety of, uh, of options open to them. And I do think that we do have a number of part-time opportunities, uh, opportunities for part-time work in the United States. I think the problem is when people are channeled into that. And I would like to see uh, mothers supported well enough with childcare and adequate amount of parental leave that they could if they wanted to uh, return to full-time work. Hey. Yeah. So you mentioned um, kind of these extremes of the low number of um, leave days the U.S. has and the really high number. Is there enough international variation such that you could get at um, empirically where that sweet spot might be? of how many days? In theory, <laughs> <laughs> you can. And we did, uh, we, we did 
actually estimate it linearly, didn't we? So we didn't see if uh, that could be. Now, it was all positive in terms of the variable that we were looking at, which was employment. And uh, that's interesting to think about, by the way, you know, that it does encourage employment. But if your dependent variable was wages, there's some work which uh, suggesting already a bounce that, that, that may be uh, more, more positive. Uh, yeah. Ranges, that's where I was looking at, maybe more positive. Sharon? Oh, hi. So I love the talk, uh, of course. Um, I'm just wondering if we could do some thought experiments. Most women have two children on average. It's the family ideal. If women took a combined year out of work for both children, what effect would that have? It's not a very long period of time, given that they work for decades. So has anybody that you know have looked at the potential costs of actually offering six months per child on average per woman? Because we're working for four decades. A year off seems like not a lot of time. Um, yeah, I, uh, and that was, I think that the 52 was per child that I had given you on average for the other okay. countries. Yeah. But um, uh, on the one hand, um, uh, so um, I, I have no objection to paid leave. Yes. And, um, and I think um, the, the um, I think what would be a little dangerous would be to mandate paid leave on the part of employers. Uh, but I think we could have it in, as a social insurance kind of a uh, program. And I, and I think that would, that would be useful. Yeah. And the costs would be? Uh, well, you know, social insurance is, in theory, you pay in for it, so that that would be that would be okay. Um, I think, in terms of length of leave, again, it's more, uh, in, and I think six months is completely reasonable. Uh, but it, you know, uh, we don't want it, to me. I don't want it so extended that employers say, "No, I don't want to get by uh, without somebody in that job for six months. I want to train a replacement." I, you know. So, I mean, for more than six months, yeah. Other questions? Okay. So, sorry, it's the time. Thanks to everyone. Uh, I, in concluding, I just wanted to say um, a couple of things since we are honoring Fran. Uh, that I particularly appreciated uh, as being a colleague of hers. And one, this may seem kind of shallow, but I enjoy being, you know, kind of getting the reflected prestige of being in a school with one of the world's <laughs> top economists. Uh, that's very gratifying, like knowing famous people. And uh, she's also a terrific colleague. She is, as you can tell, a fount of knowledge on uh, issues of gender and work. And I have come to her so often that she, for questions that, you know, when I'm teaching classes and stuff, she finally gave me one of her classic textbooks. <laughs> so I think she's made an incredibly important contribution to the ILR school. And I want to thank her for that and to thank her for a terrific talk. So. And I just want to close by thanking everyone for being here um, on such a beautiful fall day when you could have opted for Zoom. <laughs> thank you for being here. And also thank you to uh, Alex Colvin, our dean, who's here, and uh, the Alice Cook and Lois Gray uh, chairs and this lectureship has been supported by the ILR school uh, generously over uh, 15, 18 years now. And uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, and we'll continue to have this kind of conversation uh, every year. Thank you. Whatever remaining food is <laughs>